It was around 12.30 a.m. When I go outside to throw away the garbage, and the first thing I see is a woman in her 20s facing the corner of the wall of the house, as if she was being punished. And the only thing I see is her long black hair that is reaching her lower back. She was wearing a short black leather skirt and sleeveless blouse. It was quite cold outside, so I was wondering if she was alright. She wasn't crying. She was not sad. She was not waiting for anyone. She was just quiet. Hey, can I help you? No response. Are you waiting for someone? Again, no response. Are you okay? She didn't budge or make a single noise. I wanted to tap on her shoulder to get to the bottom of this, but I decided to do that after I threw away the garbage. In an unlikely case where she decides to attack me and I happen to have two full garbage bags. I walked around the corner and when I came back, she was gone. My porch was clear. She obviously did not pass me, so she must have went in the other way. And to be honest with you, I was glad she was gone. I go inside the house, lay on my bed, and it's really late at night. And I remember one very important thing. The street was empty on the other side and no one was there. Which means there was only one place the woman could have gone into. My home. I immediately grab the hunting knife I received as a gift for my 18th birthday and head out to search for the stranger in my home. I walk around silently, checking each room, under every table, inside every closet, and even in the basement. As I'm walking upstairs, I hear quick heavy footsteps running. I rush to the scene, trying to catch up to this person to confront her. I check my surroundings, and everything seemed okay. I found the front door open with the wind rustling through the gap. I go outside, and I see the woman in the distance running away fading into the darkness. She never came back, and I never saw her again. Thankfully, nothing was stolen, and more importantly, no one was hurt. Reading some of the stories on here reminded me of something that happened during my holidays this past Christmas. I went on a family holiday with my mom, dad, and brother to Tasmania which is kind of like a big island to the south of Australia. I wasn't terribly interested in the trip, just wanted to spend some time with the family, so I left all the booking to my dad, and I'll never do that again. He has his own Airbnb he manages, so I thought he would be able to find a decent place on his own. When we walked up to the Airbnb my dad had booked, the first thought I had was, if I wanted to sell drugs, I would do it here. My mom wasn't impressed at all, and was already telling my dad off for booking it. I didn't say anything. Maybe the inside is nicer. It was a dingy little house. The paint was peeling, roof was rusty, and there were plants overgrown to the side of the building. There were three entrances. The first one was the entrance for the host. It looked okay, not as bad as our entrance. A little tidier. It went downstairs, so after a while we figured out that the host most likely lived below us. The second entrance looked like it was the main entrance to the house, but it was sealed shut. The door looked like it would break down if anyone was even to push on it lightly, and it was obviously unused. The third entrance was ours, and besides the overgrown plants, it was fairly normal. We figured out later that it looks like the host had divided up the house somehow. She lives below, we live upstairs, but there was another half of the house upstairs that wasn't accounted for. Hard to explain, but the space we occupied only accounted for half of the house and only went up to the main entrance I spoke of, which was in the middle of the house. We checked in, basically just grabbed the keys. The host has never contacted us up to this point. All was well on the inside. It looked a little old, but wasn't creepy from the get-go. I did notice some odd things, and I only mentioned this to my dad. There were a bunch of antique instruments displayed on the entrance, and right on top of one of the pianos were three things that looked like urn. Now to explain, I am of Chinese descent, 
And those urns freak the fuck out of me. Some people think that they are for displaying, but we use them to store dead people's ashes. So I really, really didn't like them being there. I told my dad, and he didn't like it either. He went to tap on the urn to see if something was actually in it, but he couldn't tell. But he mentioned that the one that he had tapped was definitely one used for ashes. It had scripts on it for like safe passage to heaven from what I could make out. After I stopped freaking out, I went and picked first dibs on the biggest room as per my usual, but noticed that there were heaps of mirrors all around the room. Again, another thing, not sure if this is Chinese thing, but we don't like sleeping with mirrors facing us when we're in bed, if we can help it. So I went to move one of the mirrors, which was right in front of the bed. It was leaning against the door, so when I took the mirror off, the door actually opened the jar a little bit. That freaked me out. I got my dad, and we decided it's better if I slept with my mom in another room, and you would take this room with my brother. Again, my dad being dad, he opened the door a little and shouted, Hello? Before I told him to shut up. I had a peek inside, but couldn't make out much. Only that it was dusty and seemed to be a part of the other half of the house. My dad soon put a chair and a suitcase on top of it in front of the door to keep it shut. Fast forward to the night. Everyone was sleepy and went to bed. I stayed up a bit because I had sent Mima from work to catch up on and I went to go work in the living room. At this point, it was around 11 p.m. I remember that there were a few thumps on the roof sounded like footsteps, then followed by the loudest, most horrendous noise. It sounded like a train stopped on top of me. It was screeching like steel on steel that lasted maybe 30 seconds. I froze at this point, didn't know what to do. I thought that my dad would come check on me, but he never did. I didn't say anything the next morning because I thought I may have imagined it out of my tiredness. The following night, same thing, except I was in bed this time, just got into it. It was around this time that the same exact noise started up again. My mom woke up, but was frozen like me. My dad came in to check on us, and we were all just frozen listening to the noise, wondering what the hell it was. After it stopped, we were freaked out, but managed to shrug it off, and went to sleep. Before I fell asleep, I remember hearing some faint thumps. That stopped shortly after it started. The next morning, we kind of had a meeting of some sorts to discuss this. This is when I told them about the night before. We were all extremely unsettled at this point, and luckily, it was checkout day. We got the hell out of there and never found out what it was. The creepiest thing was, after we packed up and were well away from this place, Dad was driving, but he looked really disturbed. So I asked him if he was okay, and he said, I am now, but I did not have good sleep last night. I pressed on, and asked him, was it the noise? He said no, that didn't bother him as much compared to another thing that he had experienced. What bothered him the most was, when he left for a tour on the second day, he still had the suitcase on the top of the chair, blocking the door in his room. He had just showered, so he had left the towel on the chair to hang. He said that when he came back, he noticed that the door was slightly ajar. The chair had been moved slightly, and the towel was now on the floor, as if someone was trying to push it from the other side. I forced him to ask the host about the noise on the other side of the door. She replied that the door was to her art room, and the noises just were a possum on the roof. I don't really believe her. The noises did not seem like some animal. I work from home, doing beauty treatments. Last summer, I was working 6 to 7 days a week, 9.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m., doing nails and drowning in a god-awful chemical smell. I would end each night airing my house out with all the windows open for a few hours. One night, I sat on my sofa while the place airs and browsing on my laptop for TV unit. I had just moved a few months before. As I slouched down on the sofa, 
A creepy feeling rolls over me. Something at the corner of my eye catches my attention. I look to my window and I notice that my blinds are bent inwards, revealing a black slit of the outside. I stare deeply into the darkness, trying to figure out if my blinds got caught when I hear a man's voice say, Hey there. I instantly look away, heart pounding. The blinds fall back into place and I hear fading footsteps as he walks away. God only knows how long he had been standing there, watching me. I was so terrified and immediately rushed around and closed all my windows. When I was closing the window to my beauty room, I noticed a man a few meters away crouched down and shining a torch under the tree. A few minutes later, there was tapping on my now closed kitchen window. I didn't check it out. I was too scared. I still don't know if the guy under the tree was the guy that said hey there, or someone just looking for a lost pet perhaps. There was also a guy who had been going around beating and mutilating cats around the same time. So I was extra on edge and called the non-emergency line to log it and slept with a knife that night. Okay, so last year I was coming home late, 1130 or so. Just me and my roommate lived there. I'm the only one home at the time. I go to the kitchen to make dinner and get halfway upstairs. I hear a pounding at the door. I never answered the door because I never invite anyone over, so I just ignored it. I turn the hallway light off and the pounding gets worse. I know you're in there. Don't ignore me. I quickly close the bedroom door. I somehow move heavy furniture in front of the bedroom door, a big chest of drawers, and I grab a hammer. The pounding gets louder and louder as if the person was throwing his body against the very solid door. I call my mom, who then tells me to call the cop. The noise had stopped right when I called the cop. I tell them that someone's trying to break into my home, and just then the noise starts up again. The screaming and yelling, throwing his body against the door. Slightly nervous that the stranger might use the sliding glass door, which my roommate never locks. And thank God, it was locked this time. I stay on the phone with the dispatcher as the guy keeps yelling off his head. I can see his car still from my window. I saw you turn out the lights. I know you're in there. Let me in. I'm sorry. Let me the fuck in, you bitch. Well, by the time the cops came, the man had already left. I somehow get downstairs to talk to the cop. They end up finding the guy parked down the street from the house. They ask if I know him. I didn't, but my roommate does. It's her daughter's boyfriend who I came to apologize about smashing and breaking her hand in the car door. Well, they didn't arrest him because he didn't really do anything. I ended up filing for a restraining order against the guy. This was about two years ago. I worked at a hair salon and a restaurant opened right next to our store. The food was pretty good and we would stop there for lunch once in a while. Well every now and then the dishwasher would come out from the back of the restaurant to watch us. Didn't bother us, just watched us. He always seemed kind of creepy to me from the get go. Wore a big clear apron around himself and it just looked grimy. Hair unkempt, dirty mustache, really old. One day I went by myself and was short on cash to get some extra chicken for my burrito. So I opted not to get it. I take my food back to the salon. All of a sudden, one of the other employees comes back and gets me a thing of chicken. The dishwasher guy came in and said he wanted you to have this. Um, great. I kind of was confused by this as the guy seemed strained. I didn't eat the chicken. Well one day I'm walking back to my car and notice the cops around. Someone had gotten arrested in the parking lot so I kind of take my time getting to my car. Well who walks up to me but the dishwasher guy. He tries to strike up a conversation with me. 
How are you? How is work? Why are the cops here? I made up answers quick. Are you seeing anyone? I reply yes. I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend. I quickly say goodnight and get into my car and leave. Figured it was the end of that, but nope. This is how our meetings went. He tried to talk to me and I'd get in my car. He'd make sure to take out the trash the same times I always did. I used to acknowledge him, wave once or twice, try to be nice. But it got so repetitive and he tried to watch me in the restaurant like purposely walk out of the back. I didn't go out as often or would have someone else pick up my food. The big joke at the salon was my creepy boyfriend. We all joked about it. We all knew he had put me on edge but hadn't done anything bad yet. So I started to ignore him. Well the dishwasher guy got even stranger. He started watching me work through the salon window after he would take out the trash, just standing there. Thank God I have a male employee to walk me to my car at this point, and when that didn't work, I would go to the coffee shop next door and have one of them walk me to my car. I was starting to get anxious about running into this guy because I would always randomly run into him. The dishwasher guy came in one day when I was off and seemed disappointed, but he got a haircut from one of the other stylists. Well, the restaurant wasn't doing well at this point, and the guy just spends his days watching me. The day before the restaurant closes permanently, the dishwasher guy comes up to the salon freaking out that he needs to talk to me. My co-workers basically tell him that I'm busy. After the restaurant closed down, I never saw this guy again. This happened when I was really young on a military base. All my life I thought it was just a weird and terrifying reoccurring dream until I mentioned it to my parents when I was a teenager. They admitted that it was completely real and they just didn't tell me all this time because they didn't think it would matter to know if it was true. I was playing on the playground and my older sister was nearby but not playing with me. There was an officer's son by me though, and he started somewhat being nice. I remember him looking at me really close in the face and getting a big smile before he says, You have really pretty eyes. Now, little me is super happy and says thank you, and that's nice of you. Probably some vague compliment back. He was only a few years older than me. By the looks of it, neither of us were older than 10. He grabs a blunt stick that was lying next to me and pins me to the ground. It starts trying to gouge out my eyes within seconds. And it's at this point that I'm stupidly staring at him, confused and worried. I had never encountered violence like this in my life. And before I knew it, the kid was holding my scrawny ass down and was talking about how he was going to physically take my eyes away from me. It's then I start to panic because can you even take an eye away from people? My sister shoves him off of me and gets me up to run with her away from him to our house. There wasn't anything we felt we could do when we told our parents because, again, it's an officer's son. When I'm a teen and all this is coming to light, they told me that they did talk to the officer. They told him what his son did and that they didn't want it to happen again, but the dad was pretty entitled about it and we just ended up not going out to play as much until the kid moved away. Little psychopath grown up, please let's not meet. You've left many nightmares. When I was younger, about 8 or 9, my mom would usually drop me and my friends off at a public pool. One of my friends was about 3 years older than me, so I guess my mom thought we would be safe on our own. One day, me, my friend, her friend and her friend's older brother decided to go to the public pool with us. My friend's mom dropped us off at the pool this time and it wasn't the public pool we usually go to, but we were familiar with it. When we first entered the pool, we picked a nice spot for us to sit. It didn't take long until I noticed a man constantly staring at us. I didn't tell my friends at first. I forgot about it and finally got into the pool. We had lots of fun. 
After spending the whole day at the pool, we decided to leave. My friend called her mom and asked her if she could come pick us up. We grabbed our things and headed towards the entrance. As we were heading towards the entrance, I noticed the man that was staring at us earlier and my heart dropped. He was following us as we made our way out to the pool's entrance. Right when we finally made it out, I heard my friend yelp. I turned only to see the strange man grabbing her arm. He was trying to drag her along with him, but my friend wouldn't budge. I freaked out and so did my other two friends. We started screaming and shouting until two lifeguards came. They pulled the man away and began questioning him. The man ran away and the staff waited with us until we were picked up. Let's never meet again, sir. I just got off work. Today I worked 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Around 10.45 a man walks in. I've had previous odd encounters with this man, such as seeing him walk behind me around the neighborhood and him hanging out near my street. I had bristles off since I live right next to where I worked and figured that he just lived there also, but I always kept my eye on him. Anyway, the man comes in and orders his regular pastry and tells me, I'm gonna stay inside and eat my pastry. For anyone who doesn't know, my country is currently under lockdown because of the coronavirus and all dining indoors is strictly prohibited. Not to mention the bakery is very tiny and there had never been any tables to sit inside. Only a coffee bar that has never had space to sit. I tell him, we're on lockdown, you can't really eat inside. His response chills me. Are you alone here? Yes. I respond stupidly, but quickly try to catch myself. But my coworker will be here soon. A complete lie. It was only 11 a.m. and my coworker isn't scheduled until 1 p.m. when I'm off. Then no one will see me in here. He responds and goes back to eating his pastry at the coffee counter. I roll my eyes and go back to work, not getting paid enough to care if he quickly eats his pastry and leaves. 10 minutes pass, then 15. This guy is still in my bakery. I look over and he finishes pastry and has moved closer to the open space in the counter, meant for employees to walk back and forth between the front of the store and the employees only side. Now I start getting uncomfortable. I quickly text my coworker, who is a 30 year old man who owns a lot of guns and treats me like a little sister. I look over again and now the man is even closer and is now reading a book. He's putting the book in front of his face and peeking at me from above it, watching me. Multiple customers had come in during his stay. Every time I turn my back, he gets closer and closer until eventually he's halfway in our employees only area. I begin frantically texting my coworker and he tells me he's about four minutes away. I finally make the decision to text my boyfriend. I had avoided doing so to keep from scaring him, but now I was terrified. I sat in the back of the employee area, watching this guy. I held a knife just in case he decided to come any closer. Just as he takes a few steps closer, my coworker bursts through the door. A confrontation ensues and the man leaves the shop but continues to sit in the parked car right out in front and stares at me. I tell my coworker about the previous experiences I have had with him and he had enough. He marches out to the guy's car and tells him. The next time he comes around, it would be his last. My boyfriend pulls up at this point and joins in with a warning. So Matthew, aka my stalker, let's not meet again. This happened back in 2004 in northern Wisconsin. I was 16 at the time and out deer hunting with my dad and his friend Frank. I do remember this day like it was yesterday though. The dialogue isn't word for word, but the idea of it is 100% accurate. As a side note, it was one day after 8 people were shot, less than 2 hours away. My dad and I had a few different scans over an area of maybe 3 fourths square mile. We had been hunting there for almost 10 years and I had been going with him since I was about 5. Up until I was 12, I had just been tagging along. 
This particular morning, we walked to my stand first. It was about 5 a.m., so still dark outside. I got situated and my dad and Frank went off to the other stands over the ridge, maybe another five to 600 yards off. Sitting there in the dark is always a little eerie. Not long after my dad and Frank left, I see a flashlight from the general direction of where they were headed, maybe 200 yards away, and then roughly moving in my direction. I figured they forgot something from the truck or something, so I radioed to see what they were doing. We're sitting here in my stand. Frank is in another one. So obviously the flashlight was from someone else. It isn't super uncommon and isn't really a big deal. Those woods get crowded sometimes and there's a spot to park in that general direction. I turn on my light so the other hunter can see that there was someone there. He stopped. I see the light turn and go in a different direction. No big deal. I ended up dozing off for a while since it was still dark. When I wake up, the sun is up. It's around 8 a.m. I sit there for a bit. I radio my dad to see if he's seen or heard anything moving. Nothing yet. A couple of gunshots off in the distance is all. I get up to go for a slow walk to get my blood moving a bit. Not far, maybe 30 yards out and back. Trying not to make a sound. I come back to my stand, sit down, and take a real good look around. Nothing's really going on. I finally look out my left, where I'd seen the flashlight before, and see orange. For anyone unfamiliar, hunters have to wear blaze orange during a gun season. I radio my dad and Frank to see if either of them were moving around. Dad says no. I hear nothing from Frank. I grabbed my binoculars out of my backpack to see if it was Frank. It's definitely not. The guy is looking at me through his scope. Rifle fucking aimed directly at me. This is a huge no-no. Massive rules we have all learned in hunter's education. Never point your rifle at something you don't intend to shoot. Dumb people still do it though. It's few and far between, but it happens. My first thought was, what a fucking dickbag. Thing is, even when we look at him, he doesn't put his gun down. Now I'm starting to panic, thinking I was going to be the next hunting murder victim. I slowly grab my rifle, get up, and stand behind as many trees as I can. I walk down a little path to the side of my stand. My stand was on a kind of a little knoll on the side of a much larger hill. I radio my dad, tell him what's up. He tells me to sit tight and stay out of sight. Obviously, as a 16 year old, I couldn't do that. Every time I looked, the guy was still aiming in my direction, but was st always standing in a different spot. Like, I would look, go back to hiding, look again, and he would be 30 yards from where he was the last time. About 10 minutes of this goes by when my dad radios me. How you doing, bud? Looking back, he was obviously trying to keep me calm, but at the time, I thought he wasn't taking me seriously. He's still there, but he keeps moving. I don't know what his problem is. My dad told me to keep hidden and he'll figure it out. That he would be coming up near him in a minute or two. That's when I hear a shot. I lost my shit trying to get hold of my dad. Did he just get shot? Where the fuck is he? Did he have to shoot the guy? What the fuck is going on? I sit there for maybe two or three minutes. That felt like hours. Alright, come on out and head towards my stand. I peek over the little knoll I was behind and see my dad waving from alongside the ridge the random guy had been on. I make the trek on over to see what happened. Turns out Frank was feeling a little restless and took a little stroll and ended up on the other side of the particular ridge that the stranger was on. Not knowing where he was, he had knocked his radio battery loose while getting situated earlier in the morning and had no idea anything was going on. The shot I heard was actually Frank shooting a deer. Dad said as soon as Frank shot, the guy walked off away from us towards the logging road. We helped Frank out with the deer and decided to call it a day. Although I was extremely nervous, the rest of the weeks went on with no incident.
This all happened roughly three or four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying, at the time, I was pretty young, single, and very keen to have my first experience with a guy. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting and we had a lot of things in common. I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him since we had been talking for almost a month. Now, even though I was young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was still somewhat very cautious and a paranoid person. But for some reason that day, I made what possibly could have been the worst decision of my life. I invited him to spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend and I had the place to myself. So it seemed like a perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived about three hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to come and see me. So he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. The whole time he was driving to my plate, I had a sickening sense of doom, almost as if something was going to go very, very wrong. I almost texted him multiple times telling him that I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jumped when I heard the car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door, but he just pushed his way through and continued to stare at me blankly. All while my two French Bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never ever do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time aggressively undressing, which I hesitantly went along with as this was my first experience with a guy, especially as he was almost six years older than me. Fast forward a couple hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only 5 p.m. I told him it was fine and I would continue watching watch a movie by myself downstairs. After an hour or two I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around. I made my way upstairs and opened my door to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked him if he was okay he motioned for me to get on the bed where he sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes and put his hands around my neck lightly. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, which worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat and said, Does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am and what I look like or anything? I instantly answered saying my sister and friends who lived nearby knew. This was a complete lie, as I don't have a sister and my friends were unaware, but... Something inside me forced me to say it. After a few minutes of awkward silence, he stood up and gathered his thing. And I noticed that in his backpack, he had tape, rope, and a handcuff. Which at first didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff. But looking back, I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm going to head home. I have a long drive and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my door as I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to make eye contact or say goodbye and he raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back into my room to check if he had left anything as he left in a hurry and found a note on my desk in the word, being nice is what saved you. At the time I had no idea what the note meant. Now that I think about it, I seriously think he had very ill intentions towards me. I'm still angry at myself for letting a stranger into my home, which is obviously a big mistake, and I immediately blocked him on all my social media. I'm just so lucky that I made it out alive. All I know is he's now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say is I'm glad that he's now many miles away from me. I'm quarantined with my mom. We both are avoiding going out as much as possible because we're both compromised. So we just take short trips for any errands we need to complete in order not to go stir crazy. Today she needed to get some gas and we needed a few groceries so we both went. We saw my cousin at the gas station and after I went to one of the pumps I said hello while my mother went to go pay for gas. After she paid, I started pumping the gas, and we stood there chatting for a moment. 
When my cousin returned to the car, a man came out of the gas station. He was balding, unkept, a patchy, short beard, and glasses. The kind you see in high school photos from the 80s. He was wearing a sort of tropical shirt with a notepad and pen in his pocket and dirty khakis with a tan jacket. He stopped at my cousin's car and talked to her. She's kind of small, so I stood there watching until she got into her car safely and I heard it start. My mom and I were pumping the last bit of gas into the car. Both of us didn't need to, but we both were glad to be outside for a moment. The guy walked up to us while she finished and said, are you having fun? We kind of just glanced at each other and said, uh huh, and swatted me to make me go to my side of the car. I didn't go. I didn't want to until she got into the car herself. The guy turned to me and said, are you having fun with your granddaughter? As if he were trying to make a joke, but his facial expressions never changed. I just kind of gave him a blank stare and said, that's my mom. I squeezed between him and the bumper and moved to my side of the car. He followed closely and said, I just came here from Michigan. I haven't been here for 10 years. I got in and held onto my door. He stared at me for a while while I was holding the door, then at my face again. He gave me a blank stare and said, that's nice. My dog stuck his nose out and started barking at the guy. He's a 15 pound York and he's usually sweet, but sounded like an angry guard dog while he was barking this time. Is the dog having fun? The guy asked. I held onto the door tighter and said, I guess so, have a nice day. I closed the door quickly, locked it, and my mom drove off with my cousin following us. She had been there watching the entire time, waiting for either us or the guy to leave. My mom and I both remarked about how creepy the guy was and thought he might try to jump into the car. I'm glad I went with her. This happened a few months ago. I was at a club for my friend's birthday and we had a table with around a dozen friends with us. When we get there, a guy immediately starts hitting on me. He seemed super weird and I had a boyfriend so I politely declined his advances. Then shit got weird. While out, I feel like I see him everywhere and it started to freak me out a bit. But at the time, I didn't have a sense of any danger. Fast forward an hour. I'm chatting with a friend from high school who happened to be the bartender. Creepy guy comes up and orders a drink for him and myself, which I decline. And I explain to my bartender friend that we already have a table, so I'm good on drinks. Creepy guy did not like that. He gave me shit about not accepting his offer and that he was just trying to be nice. However, during his nice guy speech, he picked up my drink to refill it, which I again declined and asked him to excuse me while I chatted with my friend. I finished my drink, the one he picked up earlier, and finished it without thinking much more of the creeper. About 30 minutes later, I become sick and disoriented and I had my friend help me to the restroom since I felt so dizzy. After a while, I felt sick again and my female friend was nowhere to be seen. So I walked myself to the bathroom. While waiting at the door, the creeper swooped in and held on to my waist very tight and asked if I wanted to come to his table upstairs to meet his friend. I kept telling him no, that I needed to go back to my friend and he began dragging me towards the stairs telling me a list of disgusting perverse things that I refused to write here. At that point, I was terrified but my legs literally did not work. He was carrying me up the stairs. As soon as he got up there, he requested his valet to go home. At this point, I knew I was in danger, but my purse was missing, and so was my phone. While he's waiting outside, the bouncer makes a comment about my behavior, and the creep shrugs it off as too much alcohol. As we are waiting for the valet, six of my friends burst out from behind the door and begin screaming at the creeper, while one of the female grabs me and pulls me back inside. I passed out soon after and woke up about 5 p.m. the next day on my friend's couch. I thought I had alcohol poisoning until I went to the emergency room and found out that I was drugged with ketamine 
while out the night before. This guy intended to drug me and take me home with him. Since then, I have refused to go out without my boyfriend always around me. I have avoided that bar at all costs in case that creeper ever comes back. And I know to watch my drink like a hawk whenever I'm out. A valuable life lesson learned from a terrifying experience. This story occurred back in October, and I'm still shook by this. I live just outside of Red Deer, Alberta, Canada. It takes about 10 minutes to drive from where I live to the city of Red Deer. So my best friend, who I'll call Katie, and her boyfriend, who I'll call Josh, invited me for Thanksgiving dinner. In Canada, we celebrate Thanksgiving in October. So I drove about 20 minutes from my house to hers, and spent the night. We had our dinner and some wine, and some laughs. I spent the night, since I was drinking wine that night. I slept in the guest bed, while they slept in the basement with their two dogs, Emmett and Arlo. It was around 4 a.m. I woke up randomly, which was normal. I always wake up randomly in the middle of the night. Except, this specific time, I woke up and instantly felt a sense of dread. My back was facing the door, which I left a crack open that night, so it wasn't closed all the way. I just hid there for a minute, not being able to shake off that uneasy vibe that I had, and something inside of me was telling me not to roll over and look. I wanted to know why I was feeling this gut instinct, but something inside me said that it was a bad idea. So, I just stayed in the same position for a couple more minutes to see if the feeling would subside. But it didn't. Then, I heard the dogs, Emmett and Arlo, weeping. Feeling concerned, I decided with all my courage to roll over and look at the door. What I saw in the doorway to my room, I nearly shit myself. I looked, and there was my best friend, Katie, standing at my doorway just staring at me, watching me. I just about had a heart attack. She was just standing there, staring at me, with her eyes wide open. She had a straight face at first when I saw her. I then asked, Katie, what are you doing? Well, that straight, wide-eyed facial expression turned into a blood-curdling grin. Her eyes remained open, extremely wide. When I saw that, I said, Katie, what is it? Why aren't you in bed? She then backed away from my door, still having that terrifying grin on her face, and disappeared into the darkness. A few seconds after that, I got up to investigate what the hell that was. I came out of the room I was staying in, and I looked. Katie wasn't upstairs. I even looked out the glass sliding door in her kitchen to see if she might have let her dogs out. Nope. No Katie. I crept downstairs very quietly and peeked into her room. I looked, and there was Katie and Josh, sound asleep in their bed. There was no way Katie had left my room and went all the way back downstairs that quickly, without me hearing her go downstairs. Did I just encounter my best friend's doppelganger? I couldn't just leave and drive all the way back home without telling them that I left. I've never seen my bubbly and happy Katie look so cold and evil. I swear that was not her. I don't want to tell her or Josh, fearing that I would freak them out or think that I'm crazy. I'm still absolutely shocked over this. I know this wasn't a dream. I'm starting to wonder if some unwanted evil entity took the shape of Katie's body and tried to lure me into something insidious. I did ask Katie one thing that following morning. Does she sleepwalk? She told me never once in her life. To prelude, 
I was a 5'3", 23-year-old girl at the time attending university for an art degree. Right off the bat, you can assume I was a little bit nerdy, and yes, I am. This event happened October 2017, during my junior year of college. I remember it was a windy night in town making skateboarding to my next class a hassle. I figured that walking would be my best option to get to class on time, because otherwise, I would be late due to a low drag on my board. So I get off my board and start my short trek to class. It was nice fall weather outside for the time of night, and it was sort of populated, so it was safe to say that I felt at ease about walking alone. Class was about another 10 minute walk. For this reason, I decided to pop my headphones in and enjoy the next 10 minutes of my journey. All was well, and I felt unusually happy, because let's face it, late night classes aren't always the best. They actually sucked a lot now that I think about it. Though it was alright because perfect conditions called for happy times, and I wasn't going to let class ruin the vibe. Soon, that would all change. I continued walking to class, turning a corner, and strolled the last five minutes down the pavement. At that moment is when I noticed that there wasn't anyone walking about anymore. You know as humans, we have a natural instinct to feel a threat or feel if we are in danger. That indeed was what I felt walking that short distance to class. It was then that the fight or flight kicked in like a light switch, even though I didn't know for sure if I was in any real danger. Was I in danger, or was someone else in danger? I didn't know, and because I didn't know, it made trusting my instincts a whole lot worse. The building my class resided in was in eye distance, and I knew for sure that if I was actually being pursued, I had to make it to that door. So, cautiously, I continued walking, hoping to make it to class unharmed. I eagerly wanted to know for sure if I was being followed or watched, but three factors urged me not to investigate. The first was my headphones. I knew taking my headphones out would open up some more human sense to attempt figuring out if my senses were true. However, taking out my headphones risked having the person know that I'm onto them, and that is the last thing that I needed. Factor number two was my sense of sight. I could not see anything besides what was illuminated in front of me by light posts. I know you must be thinking, why didn't you just turn around and sneak a peek? Well, you see it's not that simple, as turning around would again reveal that I'm aware of the pursuer, so that definitely was not the smartest option. Lastly, my gut told me to just get to the door and I will be scot-free. Although trusting my gut made the situation that more of a reality, I realized my only way of survival at this point was to make it to that dumb door. Feet away from the door, I got the urge to make a dash to ensure that I would be safe. At this point, it was now or never, and I chose now. I made a mad dash to the silver door to the building, grabbing the handle and ripping the door open, slamming it behind me and locking it from the inside. I felt safe and secure now that I'm inside, and I now feel safe enough to see if my suspicions were correct, only to be greeted with a pavement way full of nothingness. Full of confusion and adrenaline, I stood there defeated and a tad disappointed. I felt so sure that my senses were true, but I guess I put too much faith on a whim. Nonetheless, I ended up making it to class barely on time to catch the first lecture. It was difficult to concentrate, especially after a false alarm my body decided to hit me with. It was my last class of the day anyway, so I eventually brushed off my jitters and tried my best to pay attention for the rest of the lecture. An hour later, the lecture began to die down and class was nearly over. I began packing up my belongings excited to get home and sleep, until a guy tapped me on the shoulder asking if I was okay. Confused, I said yes and asked why. What he explained to me next made my heart skip a beat. 
The guy in my class told me that he was also trying to make it to class on time, around the same 10 minutes that I had to walk to get to class. He explained that he saw me as well, and ended up rounding the same corner that I did. Immediately, I knew he was possibly following behind me, which made me feel the way I did earlier, so I asked him why he followed so close. He grew a confused look on his face, which also confused me. He said he wasn't close to me at all. In fact, he made it clear to me that he was about a half a block behind me. This sent chills down my neck and propelled me to ask the number one question in my head at the time. Did he see anyone else behind me? His face turned pale when he registered what was unfolding. He said yes and continued telling me the person following me was practically within arm's reach of me and he assumed the person was a friend or something. Like a car crash, my mind hit me with a mix of emotions of confusion and fear. Everything made sense besides one small detail. When I looked out the door to see if anyone was there, I saw no one at all. I asked him if he saw me running and confidently he said yes. I then asked if he saw the other person run as well and again, with utter confidence, he said yes. Now I'm just downright scared out of my mind and don't really know what to think. Regardless, I pulled it together to ask the only question left for me to ask the guy in my class. Where in the world did the guy go when I looked and didn't see him out the door? He hesitantly told me, before I got to the door, the person broke off and went in a completely different direction, for which I'm assuming to not get caught. More emotions and thoughts began to run through my mind. The feeling of being watched and followed were true, causing me to go into a visible panic. The guy in my class saw my distress and asked me why I didn't call the police. In my mind, I felt that to be a really dumb question. Calling the police wouldn't have done much, or possibly nothing at all, considering the person following me was within arm's reach. If anything, any sudden movements during the time could have cost me my life. Like clockwork, the class was let out to go home for the night. I was still visibly shaking from the recent information and by no means did I want to go back out there in the dark, waiting for my pursuer to potentially catch up to me. The guy saw that I was still shaken up, so he politely asked if I wanted to be escorted to my dorm, to which I immediately agreed. I admit, it was stupid to let some random guy escort me to my dorm, but if you were just as afraid as me that night, having an extra someone to talk to wasn't such a bad idea. The rest of the night was smooth and not stressful at all. Surprisingly, we talked the whole way, and I didn't get any suspicions of being followed. We made it to my dorm hall, and I thanked him for being so nice to show me to my dorm. From there, that was the end of it. Later on, that random guy in class became my husband of two years now. I'm thankful to have had him there to soothe me through that frightening experience though to this day the experience still sends chills down my spine just from thinking of it. Makes me wonder what would have happened if I didn't trust my instincts that night, or what would have happened if the person following me actually decided to interact with me. What were their intentions? Were they hostile intentions? I will never know or find out for the rest of my life, and frankly, I want to keep it that way. So, this story is from a friend of mine, but I have his permission to share it. He has told it on multiple occasions and I swear, it's one of the scariest stories I've ever heard in my life. It doesn't involve Bigfoot or ghosts or anything like that. It's a story of how reality can be way, way scarier than anything like that. For the longest time, he's worked as a trail ranger at a large national park. A trail ranger is basically a ranger, only with considerably less judicial power. He can't arrest you or anything, 
but if you're in an illegal bind or hunting stand, he had the power to call in actual cops before ripping down whatever unlicensed hide you've constructed. So this one time, he's accompanying an actual forest ranger and taking down unauthorized hunting cameras and feeders. The actual ranger was an older guy who started to feel unwell towards the early afternoon, so he headed back on his own. It was like an hour's ride on an ATV, and left my buddy to finish up. Just as he was almost done, my friend starts to hear voices coming through the trees. It's important to keep in mind that he was way, way off the beaten path at this point, so it's not like he expected there to be anyone around. But it occurs to him that these might be the people putting up the illegal cameras and blinds in the first place. He calls out to them, demanding to know who they are, but the voices just go quiet, and there's not a sound to be heard other than the occasional bird song. It's also starting to get dark by that time, so he starts heading back towards the trail, where his ATV is parked. When he finds it and tries to start it up, it won't budge. That's when he noticed that the ATV battery has been torn out and taken by someone. Not some prank by the older ranger. Someone has actually disabled his means of escape. This obviously made him extremely nervous, especially since he's already heard voices in the area. He radios back into the ranger station that he's based at, basically telling them that he needed someone to come pick him up. They reply, they'll have someone out there within an hour, but when he asks about the older ranger, they tell him he hasn't arrived back yet. Again, this made him really nervous, since the ranger should have easily arrived back by that point. He settled down and started a small fire as the sun went down, but before long, he heard those same voices again. They are not happy. At all. He said it sounded like they were in the middle of a vicious argument, with one guy angry and yelling while the other sounded frightened and apologetic. He listens for a minute or two before calling out into the darkness, asking if anyone needed help. The way he tells it, they must have heard him. He could hear them, so they must have heard him in return. But they didn't react, like they were too absorbed with their disagreement to answer him. My friend then radios back into the ranger station for a progress report. They replied, saying that they were having a little trouble finding the trail he was on, but that they wouldn't be much longer. The older ranger, however, still hadn't arrived back at the station. About five or ten more minutes go by when my trail ranger friend begins to hear the same angry voices start up again. He decides to walk towards them, hoping maybe he can prevent a potential assault and maybe even get his hands on some food and water. He walked in their direction, but the voices seemed to be getting further away. No matter how much he tried to close in on them, Finally, after like 20 minutes of walking, he gave up and hiked back to his fire. It's about then that he got a radio call that they said the older ranger guy had been found, passed out, covered in vomit, having fallen off his ATV. He was being taken to the hospital and that that had taken priority over finding my friend. I mean, that's understandable, but my friend is getting kind of frustrated at this point. He's out in the woods, on his own, and it's getting really cold. Then the voices came back. He's pretty bored at this point, and he's convinced that these guys don't want any company. So he said he just sat there in the darkness, listening to them argue over something. He's picking up little phrases here and there, when the voices begin to shout things like, Well, it wasn't yours to take. Or, It's mine, damn it. Stuff like that. He says he assumed it was two hunters, maybe arguing over a kill. But there was a good chance that they were blaming each other for the missing equipment that my friend and the ranger had confiscated. He heard the argument get louder as one of the hunters shouted something, unintelligible. Then, out of nowhere, bang. A single gunshot echoes through the woods. He immediately doused his fire 
ran a couple hundred meters into the trees, and then hid in a thicket. He said he waited there for as long as he could stand it, hearing absolutely nothing but his own heavy breathing, until he saw the lights of an ATV. He told the guy picking him up everything that had happened, and they called it into the ranger station. They had people looking for three hours out there, but not a single thing was found by any of the rangers. They came back the next day with state police and tracker dogs. It only took about an hour before a shallow grave was found. In it was a long dead corpse of a man who had clearly been shot in the forehead. The thing was, it was a skeleton that had been there for years and years, so either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. I don't really believe the last part, and to be honest, neither does he, but it certainly makes for a creepy ending to the story. But the really scary part for me is that there's every chance that the gunshot he heard that night was yet another murder, and that the body will be found in a similar way by some unwary ranger, like some horrible time loop that'll never end. Just out of college and despite having a degree, it was almost impossible for me to get a job. Day after day, week after week, I sent out my resume to every game developer and computer company in the country, and a few in Europe and Asia. Six months into this, my money was running very low. This was when I was forced to face the facts. I needed a job immediately, and it didn't matter where and for how much. Just in time, I found a job listing for a video game store at the mall. You know the one I mean, and the terrible stories you hear about them are almost all true. Because of my background in games, I was given an interview immediately and hired soon after. My first shift was the following morning. Other than a few hiccups along the way, it kept my head above water until I got with Dell two years later. The meat of the facts begin just before my second year was about to start. Because of the high turnover, I was made an assistant manager by month nine. Most of my shifts were evening, so I was tasked with keeping the younger employers in line. A job I never really took seriously since I was only a few years older than they were. I didn't give a crap how they acted, as long as they did their job. Around this time, a girl was hired that could have been my undoing. The second I saw her, I knew she would be a problem. However, it wasn't just her that was the source of trouble. Her super jealous boyfriend became a thorn in the side of every guy that worked with her, and sometimes just spoke to her. A shift of hers didn't go by without him showing up to check on her. Some nights, he would do no more than sit on the bench outside the store and watch her work. But any time she would get too close to a guy for his liking, he would approach them and physically intimidate the guy she was talking to. She never said a thing when this happened. I actually think she kind of liked it, but it would be what would push her away from him in the end. She had worked at the store for a couple of weeks, before someone showed her the hallways that ran along the back of every place. She took advantage of the fact that he wasn't aware of them, and this turned out to be a big mistake. If any person listening to this doesn't know what I'm talking about, pay attention. You're about to learn something. I'm not sure how common this is, but some indoor malls, those built in the old way, where each store inhabited an area they leased from the mall owner, there are a network of paths, or halls, that run behind each business. They're used mainly by the employees. The system allows them to enter and leave their jobs without being seen by the customers. Although, I'm pretty sure their intended purpose was to give janitorial staff an uncluttered pathway to maintain the spaces. That being said, in all my time at that job, I only saw a member of the cleaning staff a handful of times. Most of those times, they were sneaking a cigarette 
rather than working. Luckily, we could still smoke inside the building back then. No one said anything to the office if they caught you. Probably because they were doing the same thing on their breaks. If we are all on the same page now, I'll get to the real story. Like I said, his jealousy, no matter how it turned her on, was at the same time pushing her away. On her breaks, she'd often sneak out the back and disappear for a while. Where she went, I had no idea, or really cared. The boyfriend took forever to catch on, but when he did, he was super pissed. She continued this routine for a few months, and just one day, she never came back to the store. I didn't attach any importance to this. It was during the holidays and work was a nightmare. It wasn't uncommon for employees to go on a break after an especially hectic rush and not return. The turnover was simply that bad. Things got a bit more interesting about four or five days later. The police showed up and had some questions about her disappearance. I was like, disappearance? What's going on? Then they informed me that she had been reported missing the day after she bailed on work by her parents. She had never made it home and they thought that we might know something. The crazy thing was that when they visited her boyfriend's place to see if she was there, in addition to him not being there, after some digging, they learned that nobody had seen either of them for about a week. I was quick to make it clear that I didn't know crap. I had just assumed that she got sick of the place and bailed. I guess they were happy with that. I never heard from them again. Time passed, and the situation around her almost faded completely from my mind until something really big in February happened and brought it back into crystal clarity. Some workmen were renovating one of the store spaces for an incoming client, and once they had completed emptying the space of what the previous renters had left behind, they began the undertaking of finding the source of a terrible smell. Initially, it had been inferred that the smell was emitting from some old food products left behind in the space, but even after clearing, the stink remained. The next theory was that an animal like a rat had died in the wall. It had happened before. So, before they went to the extreme of busting holes in the wall to find the source of the smell, they went next door to the adjoining space that was also empty and had been for some time. They spent close to an hour sifting through the tons of old displays and leftover building materials. It turned out that the mall had been using this space for years as storage, and the place was a mess. The two guys tasked with doing this were about to say forget it, when one of them stumbled upon the source of the stink. And it definitely wasn't a rat. Someone had taken a large piece of plywood and put it over a tiny little closet, thus making it invisible. The guy had caught on that the smell grew worse as he got closer to this board. So, he pushed it aside, the heavy display rack holding the board against the wall, and as soon as he pulled back the board, he found what was causing it, the semi-mummified body of what looked like a female was laying on the floor facing the wall. It appeared that the arid and dry Arizona heat had preserved the corpse and suppressed decomposition. This had to have been why it wasn't stinking up the entire mall and managed to remain hidden for so long. Naturally, the mall was alive with talk of who the body could possibly belong to. Numbers of people had just stopped coming to work one day or skipped out during their lunch. Hell, we had gone through at least 15 people in the last year ourselves. When the answer came, no one could have guessed who it was. Early one morning, I was awakened by my manager with the news that Becky Morrison was the person they found dead in the empty store. My only answer was, Who? He reminded me that she was the girl with the crazy jealous boyfriend that had disappeared just before Christmas. I hung up and went back to sleep. When I returned for my shift that night, it was the only thing anyone could talk about. 
The next question asked was, who had killed her? The overall favorite was the crazy boyfriend. Everyone knew by now that he had disappeared just after her, and considering his body wasn't found alongside hers, it was a fair assumption. He was most definitely nuts. It made sense. The story took on a whole new angle just a couple of weeks after she was identified. An article was published in the paper discussing a possible new motive behind the murder. The police had recently received information that Becky had been messing around with a fellow mall employee during her breaks. They were meeting in the unoccupied store her body had been discovered in and having sex. After following some leads, they were able to identify the employee. He was a 22-year-old guy working in the Hallmark store, but no name was given. He told the officers that he and Becky were supposed to hook up the day she disappeared, but he got held up, and by the time he had reached the empty space, she was gone. He figured she couldn't wait and returned to work. It was only a few days later, when the cop showed up at the mall to ask questions, that he heard she was missing. His mind went straight to murder, and he was afraid he would be blamed for it, so he said nothing. Then, when the news reached him that her boyfriend was also missing, it was too late. He figured if the boyfriend was hiding out, waiting for his chance to kill the guy she had been banging, it was best for him to say nothing, just on the off chance he didn't know for sure who the guy was. It all boiled down to him being afraid, and with what I knew, I could understand. What nobody knew and still probably doesn't, is that her and I had a thing for a short while too. It wasn't long, but once is all it takes. I was the person who told her about the back hallways after all. We slipped out there a few times to mess around. Fortunately, we never got busted. When she moved on to the next guy, I wasn't hurt. I knew she had a boyfriend anyway. Now you know why I had to act as if I didn't care about her. We figured it was the safest thing for the both of us. Turns out we were right. I was overjoyed that no one knew about us. If dude was crazy enough to strangle her for cheating, which seemed to be the reason, he would no doubt come after the dude she was banging. I felt sorry for the Hallmark guy. It wouldn't take much mental math to figure out who he was, if he didn't already know. And since they still haven't found him, to this day, the fear of her boyfriend popping up out of nowhere and putting some holes in him must have been real strong. I know I was looking over my shoulder for several years after. The police have this theory that he had committed suicide not long after the murder. There hadn't been any activity on his bank account or cards for years, but I still wasn't taking any chances. Nine years later, a week doesn't go by that I don't think about her. An outsider may have seen her as an easy girl, but I still don't think of her that way. It struck me that she was just looking for a guy that would treat her well and commit to her for the long term without being psychotic about it. She was a genuinely good person, and certainly didn't deserve the end that she got. But then again, I can't think of very many that do. This all happened the night before I moved onto the campus dorms of my local university. I was living with my mom and dad at the time and I was excited for the freedom that awaited me. So naturally, being an insomniac, I couldn't sleep, and I decided to go on one of my nightly walks. I lived about three quarters of a mile from a gas station, so I figured I'd go get a soda. It was around three in the morning when I snuck out of my parents' house. Everything seemed relatively calm, and I enjoyed my walk. This all ended when I walked past a house with a running car in the driveway. This set off some red flags because I live in a town with a lot of drug-related crimes and the whole situation looked really seedy. One of the men looked at me and it made me really uncomfortable. 
so I picked up my pace and made my way to the gas station. The gas station was closed, which made me really upset because Google said they were open 24 hours. So I posted a mini rant on Snapchat, and I made my way back home. The gas station scenario made me forget about the shady car situation, and I just walked right past it. Then a chill went down my spine as I saw the glow of headlights coming from behind me. My heart dropped, and I had a powerful sensation of dread. The car followed me very slowly for 20 seconds. Then, my flight instincts kicked in, and I ran. This hasn't been the first time I've been followed by a car, and my paranoia went into overdrive. I ran so fast I'm convinced that I could have won medals for it. I ran through a church parking lot and hid behind a building. It was a large Catholic complex that doubled as an elementary school. So a large church and several mobile home buildings lined the property. I hid behind one of the mobile homes and heard a man get out of the car and call out. He eventually got in the car and rounded the street corner so he could see the other side of the complex. Since I would be visible to him, I snuck around so I was in between two mobile buildings. I was in a position where I could see the glow of his headlights on the street. For ten minutes I waited for him to leave. He repeated the process of calling out and looking for me. I looked out again and saw that the headlights were gone, so I figured it was safe to leave and make my way back home. As I was walking down the road, the glow of the headlights came back on, and within a minute the car was next to me. I kept thinking to myself, I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm dead. The man rolled down his window and asked if I needed a ride. I told him no since I don't live that far away. He kept asking if I needed a ride and I kept declining. Eventually he said good night, but proceeded to follow me slowly. So I just walked up to a random house and pretended it was my house. Thankfully he resumed a normal driving pace and was gone fairly quickly. I left the yard and made my way home. It's been a year now since that happened, and I still get jumpy when a car passes me while I'm walking. I don't go on nightly walks as much as I used to, and when I do, I'm constantly on edge. I don't want to know what that man had in store for me if I had taken his offer for a ride home. This is a story of something that my dad witnessed unfold when he was a kid in northern Texas. He was born and grew up on his family's farm until he was drafted to fight in Vietnam. In that neck of the woods, most of your neighbor's farms may be over five miles away, but the neighborly spirit of helpfulness meant all one had to do was ask and assistance would be given without a second thought. There was an exception to that rule, however. The two landowners located to the north of his family's place had been at war since, some said, the Civil War. One farmer had been a loyal Democrat and slave owner, while the other was supposedly the head of a recently arrived Yankee family who was a supporter of Abraham Lincoln and the newly formed Republican Party. The Yankees were also wealthy and had purchased a large plot of land that the other farmer had his eyes on for some time. Like so many other families at that time, and in that part of Texas, what started off as a disagreement over politics, the coming war would only serve to worsen. Upon the end of that bloody conflict, and with the return of both men from fighting in it, those in surrounding area hoped the differences between them would be squashed. But this was not to be. The bitterness that had always been there, seething just below the surface, would break free anew after a dispute over a property line sprang up. Josiah Campbell, the patriarch of the pro-Union Campbell clan, had purchased a 500-acre piece of land just before the war had broken out. This large parcel adjoined to his neighbor to the east, Samuel Johnson's property. 
But it wasn't until 1883 when Campbell began to put in fencing to keep his neighbor's cattle from encroaching onto his land. Did the already hostile relationship between the two landowners reach a new and dangerous boiling point? Multiple face-to-face -face confrontations would ultimately lead to a court battle in which Campbell would come out the victor. If Campbell believed the court's judgment would be the end of the argument between the two families, he would be proven terribly wrong. Many more disagreements, some of them over insignificant things, would arise in the following generations. One of the more notable involved Josiah, now a grandfather, in which a stray bullet would come very close to striking him. Although most in the area assumed Samuel or one of his sons fired the bullet, it could never be proven. Incidents similar to this would only serve to keep the bad blood between the families just hot enough. My family's part in this drama is small. Financially and politically, our lot was similar to that of Johnson's. A native Southern family arriving in Texas during the Republican period from Tennessee. However, that's where the similarities ended. From what has been passed down through generations, Samuel Johnson and most of his offspring were ignorant and always looking for a fight. One specific story claims that my great-great-grandfather even stopped attending church because of them. Their attempt at avoiding any involvement in the whole mess was well fought, at least until a quiet morning in 1962 when they would be pulled into it, whether they liked it or not. It was a warm June morning. My dad and his family went to church like usual. Everything was normal that day, except for the conspicuous absence of the Campbell family. The section they had been sitting in since the building of the church was glaringly empty. Because of this, mutterings quickly began to spread through the congregation. The Johnsons sat quietly in their own section, doing their best to ignore the rumblings around them. The Reverend waited, but was eventually forced to go on with the service. On the drive home, the family passed the Campbell place, expecting to see the bustle of the daily work and those involved in doing it. However, not a soul was seen, and the house sat still, showing no life within. My grandfather dropped the women off at the house and he and my dad returned to the Campbell place to take a closer look around. As they approached the home, the uncomfortable silence was broken by the slamming of a screen door. It had been left open and free to swing in the wind. The noise brought out the livestock, and their incessant mooing showed that they had yet to be fed or milked. If this was truly the case, something had to be very wrong inside. My dad ran into the barn and fed them quickly and rejoined his dad at the door. They were able to enter with no problems. Unlocked doors were still a common practice in those parts, but that would soon change. There were no signs of life in the back part of the house. My grandfather called out but received no answer. If anyone was still alive inside, the creaking of the stairs as they climbed them certainly would have caused them to stir but no one appeared. The two men separated as they reached the landing, each heading for different closed doors. Just by chance, my father was the first to discover the fate of the Campbell clan. Two small bodies laid still. In their little blood-soaked beds, John Jr. and William had been shot repeatedly as they slept. Upon taking in the sight, my dad rushed from the room battling the urge to throw up. He was still, just barely out of childhood himself, and yet to have witnessed something so horrible. His father was just about to enter the bedroom of the Campbell parents when his son came rushing from the room. Although no words were exchanged between the two, my grandfather knew what horrors the room behind him likely held. The scene in the parents' room was much like that of the children, both elder Campbells laid motionless and bloody in their large Victorian bed. They had been shot with a shotgun to the head, but John Sr., the patriarch, had been shot several more times. 
So much so, it was impossible to definitively identify him. Despite this, there was no doubt the heinously slaughtered man was indeed John Campbell, and the man behind the shotgun was his lifelong adversary, Matthew Johnson. The ill-tempered Matthew's absence from the morning services was almost as noticeable as that of the Campbells. The manhunt that followed didn't last long. Matthew's body was found hanging in the loft of the barn, and the death was ruled a suicide. The motive behind the terrible act, more than likely, was the latest in their long string of court battles. This time, the Campbells found it necessary to bring Matthew into another expensive and drawn-out case over the water rights along the long, disputed property line the two families shared. After more than three years of fighting, the Johnsons would ultimately come up on the short end of the stick. What would have been just another link in the chain that had connected the two farm dynasties for over 100 years proved to be the end of the Johnson family's hold on their land. It was later discovered that they had been barely managing to keep their heads above water, from harvest to harvest, and John Campbell's suit and their eventual loss was the final blow. Once Matthew no longer had anything left to lose, the century-old bitterness between the neighboring families broke free and gave him the justification many of those before him lacked. His wife told the sheriff all she claimed she knew. Her husband had stepped out just after sundown, only to return two hours later with a substantial bit of blood on his shirt. She stood by their bedroom window and watched as he burned those same clothes. After he finished this, he came to bed and went to sleep like normal. However, the next morning when she awoke, Matthew was not in the bed next to her. She searched the farm, but he was nowhere to be found. The family went to church like normal because she feared their absence would cause people to talk. She swore she had no idea what her husband was going to do when he left that evening, or what he had done when he returned. It was clear that he had done something dark, but his target wasn't known. The remaining members of the Johnson family had an auction for their few valuables and vacated the property soon after. Dad said that they were rumored to be living in Wichita Falls, and Matthew's wife had remarried, but once he went off to the war, he never heard anything else about them. The ownership of their former homestead and adjoining land was purchased by a big land company out of Fort Worth, who broke the land up into smaller parcels and sold it off to new buyers. As for the Campbell land, the place would sit empty for many years. The slaughter that took place inside, tainting the value of an otherwise beautiful home. That land, too, would invariably be broken up and become a massive housing subdivision when the area and all the remaining family farms were consumed by the nearby city. I hope this fits here. This happened when I was around 12. By that time, my parents got divorced and I lived with my mother, who had some pretty wild theories about my father. One day we went to the bookstore with my two brothers. I already knew which book I wanted to get, so I was the first one to get and buy my book. I then asked my mom if I can go to the car already. She gave me the keys and I went to our car parked right outside the bookstore in a little parking spot. The parking spot wasn't visible from the main street, since I was a little covered by trees and bushes. I got into the car and started reading my book. About maybe five minutes later, a nice car rolled up and next to ours and a man in a nice suit got out. I kind of ignored him, but I can hear that he was on his phone with someone. I heard little pieces of the conversation, but the things I still remember him saying are, yes, I got the candy, and, of course, he's sitting right next to me. At that point, I got a little scared because he was standing on my side of the car door next to me, and there was no one else in his car or even on the parking lot. I don't remember if I locked the doors or not, 
but after a few minutes, he hung up and turned to me. Do you want some sweets? Open the door and I can give you some. He held up a pack of something. Maybe gummy bears or something. I don't remember exactly. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Are you sure? He didn't try to enter forcefully and he sounded pretty nice and polite. I think at that point, my mom got out of the bookstore because he left pretty much instantly. My mom didn't see any of what had happened and asked me the regular, Everything okay? I told her what had just happened and she was shocked. But other than that, I never saw him again or had anything like this happen. As a college student who frequents home, my parents are kind enough to pay for my gym membership. For me, while I'm home on break so I can keep my workout routine, I'm training for an OCR in May and have been working out for some time now to build muscle. The gym I go to, I have had no problems with in the past. Everyone is generally friendly and helpful and minds their business. Today was different and my gut feeling confirmed this. I was doing a pool day routine when a guy bumped into me and I thought he needed to use the cable. I was finishing using. I said he could use it and went over to my next set by the free weights. He was wandering around the gym making eye contact with me and trying to get my attention. I kept him in my sights but didn't instigate him at all and just minded my business. What freaked me out was that I didn't see him touch one weight or put on his headphones and when I caught him staring he never looked away. I was considering asking someone nearby to watch him to see if he was staring, but I decided against that. My gut still told me that something was wrong. The whole time I was texting my brother about this dude, who I now notice was obviously watching me at this point and following me. He was also watching other girls too, not only me. But there were only about five girls in this gym, and three of which were in the younger ages, including me. I went to the functional fitness area and was going to do my last set and sure enough, this guy followed me in there and looked around like he was going to do something but didn't touch one weight. I was the only female in that area. I went to the far corner and pretended to take pictures of myself flexing and got him in my camera's view so I could document it. After I started taking pictures, he started coming closer. I grabbed my stuff and booked it out of there into the woman's locker room. He tried to get my attention as I was leaving, but I kept walking. I texted my brother and said, he's fucking following me. As soon as I got into the bathroom, my brother called and said he was on his way. He knew the guys working the front desk and said he would talk to them for me. He also wanted to chew this dude out, obviously. By the time he got there, the two other younger girls were also talking to the manager, saying they had the same thing happen. They were in the woman's locker room while I called my brother in a panic. The manager said something that freaked me out. This. This was the second time this has happened this week. Not with the same guy, but scary nonetheless. Not only that, but the guy had sat down in the waiting area by the front doors, which is on the other side of the front desk. The woman's bathroom is right behind the front desk area and behind the cardio desk for a solid 10 minutes before he got up and left. I feel like he was waiting for me to come out. The manager said the guy had been in the gym before to train with someone who worked there, but then he stopped going for some reason. One of my theories was that he was new and didn't know where to start. He wasn't a super built guy, but he obviously had been there before. There was also a possibility that he may have had a social disability, but as far as I know, my gut told me there's something very wrong about the situation and from the way he looked at me and followed me. Even as someone who is strong and getting stronger by the day, it's not hard for me to make someone feel in danger in these situations. To those of you who frequently go to the gym, make sure you're aware of your surroundings at all times. I'm a 22 year old female, used to do DoorDash on the side for some extra cash. This was in the summer of 2018 when it was a little bit newer. At least in my town it was. Since then I think they've made a lot of changes, but at the time it was a little unorganized. 
If you don't know what DoorDash is, it's like a food delivery service, typically for restaurants that don't deliver. I think McDonald's, etc. Anyways, the one night I was doing deliveries all day. I decided to do my last delivery around 10 p.m. So I got an order and, and the person wants a medium cheese and pepperoni pizza and a loaded potato wedges from a pizzeria nearby. I was kind of wondering why they'd order from a pizzeria that delivers, but I figured it was because this place was notorious for taking forever when you order out for delivery. I accepted the order and headed to the pizzeria. I got there and picked up the pizza, confirmed on the app that I'd picked everything up and was on my way. The app notified me that the special instructions that the customer asked for, which was for me to call them when I was outside. Okay, nothing unusual there. Lots of people ask that so they can come out to me. I get to their address and it's downtown. It's a larger apartment building and it's completely pitch black. And I instantly get an eerie feeling. So I pull up to the curb, stay in the car. Hell no, I wasn't about to go near that building. And call the number. Luckily DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number. It rings a couple times and then this really creepy woman's voice comes on the line and says, We can't get to the phone right now. We're a little tied up. And then creepily giggles. Meanwhile, the entire time in the background, there's another woman screaming. And I mean screaming for help and for her life. It even got louder as if the creepy woman was purposely putting the screaming woman on the phone. I instantly hung up and drove off real quick, not even knowing which direction to go. Luckily there was a super populated restaurant a couple blocks away, and I pulled into the parking lot and pulled up the app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order, so I contacted DoorDash Help Center and they told me I had to wait 15 minutes to see if they'd call me or message me about their food. Well, they never called and thank God for that. I'm sitting there in the parking lot of the restaurant telling my mom about it and we agree that it was probably a prank, but that just in case it isn't, I need to call the police. So I called the non-emergency number and tell them everything. The police tell me they're going to do a wellness check and actually thank me for calling them about it. I went home and nothing ever came of it but I still think about that from time to time. I did get a free pizza and potato wedges though, so that's pretty cool. Creepy lady in the apartment, well, let's not meet. And to the lady screaming, I hope you're safe and okay. This is a super long story and it happened to me about seven years ago. So when I was 16, I was dating a guy who was just a little older. We'll call him Mitch. My parents never let us hang out alone, but to my surprise, I let him come on a family camping trip with us. I think because it was a kind of special occasion, since the camping season was ending, and also the site we were going to had been kind of a tradition for us, but this season when it closed, it would never again reopen for camping, because people ruined it by dumping trash and trespassing nearby properties. Anyway, so my dad, mom, Mitch, and I were all going camping. Mitch and I have our own tent. My parents have theirs and have an amazing first day there. We went on Friday morning and planned to stay through Sunday night. Mitch and I spent the day walking along paths, catching lizards, swimming, exploring, and talking about creepy pastas that involve the woods. At some point, we were exploring and realizing that we were near properties, maybe two to three cabins, about four miles down the dirt road from our campsite. Later that night, my parents made a big fire, and we were eating burgers. My parents were drinking, and Mitch and I were trying to make s'mores while also trying to pretend we weren't terrified after talking about creepy pastas all day long. I'm in the middle of trying to explain the rake to my sloshed parents. And Mitch gasps, because there's a guy walking down the road from the direction of the cabins. Again, it was like four miles away. So we're all kind of quiet, and my dad calls out to the guy. Something like, hey, how's it going? And the guy doesn't say anything back. My dad called again, yelling, are you camping? We have this spot reserved. 
Not in like a mean way, just trying to get the guy to respond. The guy still doesn't say anything until he's like right up to our campsite. Which was weird as hell, because it looked like two minutes of silent walking to get to us after we first called out to him. He comes up closer to us and is like, Hey there folks, I just like walking around. Sometimes I take a walk down by the cabin, see if anyone's camping. So this guy sits down and talks to my parents for a while. My parents are super drunk and I think they've been smoking pot all day. I don't know at this time, but when I was older they told me that they were big potheads my whole childhood. Because they were surprisingly chill with this strange man appearing and were very friendly. They all talked about what a shame it was that the camping season was ending and how terrible it was that the campsite was closing, etc. Mitch and I whispered back and forth, and we were talking about how weird this guy was, how weird it was that he walked this far, didn't talk at first, and just invited himself to our campsite. Then we started noticing other things. Mitch pointed out that the guy's zipper was down, and he had some lengthy cargo shorts on, his boxers were like poking out. And then I pointed that in this entire interaction, the guy had been here maybe 10 to 15 minutes now talking to my parents. He hadn't even acknowledged us with a single word, despite sitting across from the fire from us and constantly looking at us. Then we both started to notice how this guy was mimicking my parents. He went from being sober to acting like he was drunk. He started slurring his words, getting a bit wobbly, laughing which sounded very strange and being louder. Mitch and I were so freaked out. We had actually been talking about creepypastas all day and then this encounter felt like a creepypasta. The guy had kept acting stranger and stranger and there was no way of saying anything to my parents without him hearing. Mitch and I stood up and walked a few feet behind us over to the cooler to pretend to get some stuff out to make hot dogs. As soon as we'd backed off a few feet the guy switched the conversation to talk about us. He asked my parents if this was a double date, and they explained I was their kid and Mitch was my boyfriend. He asked how old we were, and they told him. I was 16 and he was 18. He asked if we were good kids, and they said yeah. Then he asked, Well, where are they going to go sleep tonight? I froze and I looked at Mitch who had reached out and squeezed the fuck out of my forearm in fear, and was staring at me wide-eyed. To my drunk, maybe high parents, this question didn't seem weird enough for them to even pause. The guy was still pretending to be drunk, and he was playing it pretty well up to this point, nearly falling off the tote that he was sitting on. My parents were like, laughing. We got them their own tent. The guy said something like, Oh, that's awful nice of you. That'll be an experience for them. I can't explain it, but the way he said it was so sexual. I think this is when my parents kind of clued into this weirdness. I looked at my mom, who looked kind of slack-jawed and uncomfortable, and was staring at me with a quizzical look. The guy kept talking to them, asking them, Well, I see one tent. Where's the other one? My dad was still talking to him. Couldn't barely keep his eyes open at this point. He was so out of it. My dad mentioned towards my parents' tent and said that that was theirs, and then threw his arm back super exaggerated in the direction of our tent. Really not very far at all. And was like, and theirs is way over there. The guy perked right up and actually stood up a bit and pointed to their tent and said, so, that's your tent. And my dad agreed. And their tent is in that direction? And my dad fucking agreed. At this point, I'm like shaking my head at my mom. And she looks pretty freaking sobered up. The guy kept talking to my dad about the tents. And how he can't see Mitch and I's tent from there. It must have been pretty well hidden or very far away. That's so nice of my parents for letting us have some alone time, etc. Mitch and I say that we're going on a walk, and despite the woods being pitch black and us being creeped out, we go out walking down the trail, the trail the guy happened to come from. 
we get away far enough and not to hear them and could barely see the fire. And we pull out our phones to see if we have cell signal. And of course we don't. I'm being super dramatic and type out and send my friend a long message describing the situation, date, time, and description of the guy, and that I love her. And my phone gives me the message that it'll send it when it finds service. The whole time I type, I'm reading it out loud to Mitch, and he's telling me the stuff to add. We try to psych ourselves up and start walking back to the campfire. The guy is gone, but I thought maybe he was just peeing. So I whispered to my mom asking where he is. Both my parents are like, he went back to his cabin a bit ago. He didn't pass you on the road? We're just like, what? We started really freaking out now that we feel safer now since he's gone and we can actually talk to my parents. And we start yelling a mile a minute at my parents how he didn't pass us about his fly being down and him acting drunk to match them about how he really pressed to know where we'd sleep that night. My mom agreed with us and said that she noticed it too, and it really freaked her out. My dad was pretty trashed, but said he got a really creepy feeling from the guy. Mitch and I stayed with them and talked about the guy and how freaked we were about for another hour. And then my parents wanted to go to bed. Mitch and I went and ran to our tent and hauled ass with the whole tent and all of the belongings in it getting thrown around and slid it right next to my parents tent we couldn't sleep all night long because every crunchy leaf made us think the guy was creeping up no exciting camping sex we had that night but at least we didn't get murdered from around the age of 20 to 23 i used to spend like one or two nights in town drinking and doing what most young adults do which in my case was failing to seduce anyone, but winning at pool and quiz machines. When I first started going out 18 plus, I would go to many different bars and clubs throughout the night with all my old friends from school and over the next few years they went away to university. I ended up befriending locals and started hanging out around in this one bar with a group of friends I had made. This group was about 15 people, a mix of guys and girls between the ages of 18 and 25. We were the main crowd for this one bar. Everyone who came in frequently would get to know our group and hang around hoping to join us or keep clear of us. I was really enjoying myself and started going out more often to meet my friends in this bar. I was drinking a lot and starting earlier in the day. I grew out of this stage in my life eventually. So anyway, this one girl that wasn't really part of the social group but was one of her friends started being friendly with me, hugging me when she saw me, following me outside if I wanted to smoke, usual stuff. It's not like she was the only person who did this but over time it started to become a problem. See at first I thought she was just friendly, I just couldn't see her in a romantic light because she wasn't my type and so I just didn't consider that she was attracted to me. So when she was friendly, I would be friendly back. This, I guess, was a mistake. My part. I thought I was just being a nice guy. I don't want to be mean now, but I kind of have to explain to her a little bit. You might describe her as obese. She was fat. Very fat. Not the sort of chubby side, not the middle age, losing your figure type of fat. She was the round, bouncy, first thing you notice about her is that she is fat, kind of fat, and she smelled bad too. I don't know if that's related to the weight thing, but it meant that having her in my personal space was not enjoyable, but I put up with it multiple times a week because I don't know what to do. She was nice to me, so I didn't want to upset her, but the smell was so bad. Oh. And she was my age. Anyway, after I had known her for a few months and became accustomed to her just always being around, I started to notice something. Territorial behaviors. So for example, if I was talking to a girl I liked, then she would often come over and make that dialogue a trialogue. You know, 
and she started getting kind of girlfriendly with me. Like she would get super upset by bits of banter and like drama cry out loud. Or she would try to start crying about her personal stuff and other girls would come up to me and tell me how upset she was and that I should go check up on her. I'm going to call her Gary. So I would go talk to her and say like, hey, don't get upset. What's up? And she would instantly be fine and hugging me and stuff like, ugh, for fuck's sake. So as this developed, I started getting tired of having to stop what I was doing and go see if Gary was okay. So I stopped. She would send naive girls to go and ask me to check on her. And I would tell them that I didn't care what Gary was doing. It had nothing to do with me. And the girls would tend to agree. You would think problem solved, right? Somehow she got my number. So I would be at home and I would get a text asking me to come to the bar. Or I would get a personal text like, I'm still upset with you because of last night. Sometimes I would engage in conversation with a rather confused attitude and other times I would ignore it. Pretty soon it got to the point where she would be in the bar every time I got there. Or she wouldn't be there and I would be relieved. But she must have convinced a few people to notify her if I was in there because she would turn up not long after I got there. I would be dreading the moment the door opened and she would say hello to everyone in the bar but deliberately make her way to me. So I decided I need to distance myself from her. I was feeling a rather tad pursued, but at the same time, I didn't want to stop seeing my friends, some of whom I was actually interested in, and some of them were into me, too, but this Gary girl's drama was really making it difficult. So I started just casually walking away from her, if I was heading outside to smoke and saw her follow me, I would squeeze into a position that meant she couldn't stand next to me, or I would pace back and forth so she couldn't get too close to me for more than a second. If I was talking to people and she appeared, there I would move over to a different conversation. She would follow soon after. I remember a few times where I was literally running in circles around the pool table trying to get away from her. Once she figured out what was going on, she started using psychology. She would bitch about me, stir rumors about me, and just generally try to turn people on me. On the occasion that I would be talking to the same people that she was, the conversation would quickly become about me. She would know about everything I had said to the people. Any drama that involved me, she would know about, and it seemed like anyone who had reason to be upset with me or had some past issues with me was being interrogated for information. I don't know what to do about it, so I just went back to being friendly with her. It was better to have her as a stalker than have her as an enemy. I figured she'd get tired. She didn't, but something better happened. I was playing pool with the guy one day, and he was friendly. Suck up, nervous, skinny. Spotty kind of guy. Anyway... I was beating him at pull over and over again, and Gary was there being a mix between a cheerleader and a bitch. She was constantly commenting on our game and trying to get a rise out of me, and I was just taking the piss out of her back, but it was pretty friendly. Our weird dynamic had gotten quite comfortable now. Anyway, he picked up on the way I was speaking to her, and he started mimicking it, and she was enjoying it. So I was like, holy shit, the light bulb. It was his turn to break the balls and pool. But before he took a shot, I needed to pee. So I went outside for a smoke and Gary follows me. Naturally, I started playing matchmaker, telling her that clearly this guy liked her. Do you like him? That kind of thing. Telling her that she liked him and I could tell because of the way she was talking to him and stuff. I don't know if she liked him immediately, or if she thought it was making me jealous, but either way she started being way more obvious with her flirting with him, and me, which was fucking gross, but I held it together. Finally I got the chance to speak with him, without her around, and I didn't need to convince him that he liked her at all. 
This dude just straight up liked her and was open about it. I was flabbergasted, but so freaking happy. I told him that he had asked her out. He said he couldn't. He didn't know how. I was like, fucking hell. She defo likes you, I can tell. She was still too scared to do it. So, when they were both next near shot of me, I said, You two seem really good together. You should totally try, like, going out together sometime. They looked at each other all embarrassed, but didn't agree to anything, so I made them give each other's numbers. And over the next few hours, I started asking them when they would next be meeting. I went full on getting the rest of the bar involved, making them the center of attention. By the end of the night, they were in each other's arms. They really got on. I saw way less of Gary after that. Every time I saw either of them, I would ask if they were still together. They fucking were. <laughs> Maybe they still are now. I don't know, it's been like six or seven years. It was a pretty happy ending, right? The funny part is, he was one of those super skinny guys, so the stereotype of skinny guys and big girls might be true, you know? I love Reddit videos on YouTube, and recently found this subreddit and thought this story would fit. So, a short backstory. My older brother would work for his now ex-girlfriend's dad as a janitor. He was 19 and I recently turned 17. I'm now 19. His girlfriend was in my class and asked her dad to hire me. This job was a contracted job, so we would go to the business and clean their bathrooms, cafeterias, kitchens, and take out the cubicle trash. There were about four different buildings all belonging to this one building, so I rarely saw my brother, who was constantly at the main building. Eventually, I was moved to the main building where my brother and I worked together. I made sure to be an annoying little sister at times, so he didn't like to work in the same area with me. But we would work with our co-workers in the bigger areas together, like the cafeteria. One of the co-workers was around 45, and her son was a grade younger than me. I'll call her Lisa. So, we're the only two working at another building together before moving to the main building. When we had our breaks, she would offer me a cigarette every now and then. I always accepted as I smoked prior, but had quit when my dad found them and made me throw them out. Now the story begins. There was a man, about 58 years old, who worked at the main building in the production area. I'll call him Bob. There were only two bathrooms, a small office and a trash compactor. So I rarely went there. The production area in the main hall I go outside was connected by the cafeteria. One day while we were cleaning the cafeteria, I was vacuuming the rugs, when Bob came up from behind me and poked my sides. This obviously scared me, as my brother was in front of me, cleaning the counters. He started laughing about how high I jumped and randomly being touched. I turned around and it was Bob. He was laughing as well. I thought it was odd, but since my brother was laughing, I brushed it off. I can't remember exactly how it all started, but I think that was it. Bob kept badgering me about friending him on Facebook. I kept saying that I forgot and would add him the next night, but never did, until I eventually got annoyed and just added him. He would text me every weekend asking how I was and what I was doing and when would be the next day I was working. I didn't see anything wrong with it at first, so I replied. Bob would go on a smoke break with Lisa. I would join them, because they would offer me a cig, and I couldn't buy them anymore, out of fear that my dad would find them. Nothing out of the ordinary happens on our smoke breaks. We would small talk about our days and such. Lisa had a boyfriend, and things were pretty rough between them. This all happened in the span of a year, so... The timeline is a bit blurry. At one point, Lisa stopped going on smoke breaks with me and Bob. I learned Bob's break schedule and would stop working just to go out and smoke with him. By this point, I was addicted to cigarettes again. I didn't tell Bob, but I only talked to him so that he would give me a free smoke. Edit. 
I forgot to mention that Lisa's boyfriend started working with us. He asked me if Bob was my boyfriend or my dad because the relationship between us was hard to tell because how close we were. Bob would say things like, I'm basically your dad. We get along so well. He once said I look like his 20-something year old daughter. And people think we're father and daughter. But the worst thing he said was, someone asked if we're dating or related. And I told them, it's none of your business. I had a boyfriend that he knew about and that kind of upset me a lot. I didn't try to correct him because I was afraid my free cigarettes would stop. When winter came around, we would smoke in Bob's car. He always started his car so we would have the heat. But a few times, he would put the car in drive and drove around the parking lot. I didn't panic, but I made sure I had an escape plan. Plus, my brother would know where I was and would get worried if I never returned. Bob also called everyone pet names like Honey, Princess, and such. So I never thought anything of it when he called me them. He once even commented on a profile picture, Very beautiful, Princess. As in Bob's mind, he was my father figure. He also thought that Lisa was my mother figure. I have great loving parents at home, so I never looked at any of the adults as parental figures. He would tell Lisa and I that he wanted to take us out to eat, and we could drink at his apartment afterwards. Basically a family night. We had mentioned that it could be fun, but never went into further detail about it since we both knew we wouldn't be going. Bob would tell me about his life and how lonely he was. He confessed to me his undying love for Lisa and said things like, I can give her a much better life than her boyfriend. And, if she would just give me a chance, I could make her happy. Lisa cut all contact with him and he was heartbroken. I told my parents about Bob and they agreed that he was acting very odd. I asked him to talk to my older brother as I thought that he should have said something to Bob, telling him to leave me alone. He would always laugh when Bob scared me, so I pushed off the creepy vibes for months. By this time, I turned 18. I once made the mistake of trying to joke. A man passed us while we were at the smoke pit and asked if I was Bob's daughter. I said, might as well be. Big mistake. After this, Bob started giving me side hugs and eventually kissing the top of my head, less often than the hugs. It even got to the point of him telling me he loves me. He would walk beside me and take my phone out of the back pocket, then compliment me how fast did I reacted, saying, I'd never grab your butt. I just wanted to see what you would do. A new lady around 36 started working with Bob in production, and he forgot all about Lisa He focused on this new lady. She now joined us on smoke breaks and he would even drive her to the store after work since she didn't have a car. She also had a rough patch with a boyfriend which made Bob complain the same way he did about Lisa. My older brother quit and my younger brother took his place. He would join us at the smoke bid but eventually stopped going because he didn't like smoking. I asked him what he thought about Bob. He said Bob was extremely creepy. I agreed. On Halloween, the new lady and I both dressed up. Bob took a picture on his phone. He even made our picture his lock screen. I just thought that he was using me as a way to get a picture of her, and he wanted her as his lock screen, not me. When the new lady stopped working at the business, Bob was heartbroken again. He told me that he tried to keep in touch with her, but she blocked him with no warning. He turned back to Lisa. She would sometimes smoke with us, but not nearly as much as she did before. When we walked down the hall, he would make sexual jokes to her. From what she told me, he had made jokes to me too, but not nearly as sexual, so I never caught on. She stopped talking to him again. I told my boss and co-workers that I was joining the Air Force soon and would quit a month before basic military training, so I can enjoy the time with my family. I mentioned this to Bob once. He acted like a proud father and gave me life advice that I didn't pay attention to. I had enough of him sexually harassing my co-worker and giving me the creeps. My boyfriend was also joining the Air Force and wanted me to quit my job sooner than I planned. Two months before my scheduled BMT date, 
Bob brought up a dinner idea, again, but this time without Lisa being invited. He said that we could watch movies in his apartment, and he would buy me whatever alcohol I wanted, if I fell asleep. He would put me in his bed, and he would sleep on the couch. I told him that my parents would never let me sleep at an older man's apartment, and my boyfriend would be super upset. He told me to lie to them about where I was going. I declined. He also thought that when I was on leave, I would go to his work and surprise him. His logic. I knew his work schedule. He honestly thought that we were so close that I would go out of my way with the limited time I had with my family while I was home just to go back to where I used to work so I could smoke a cigarette with him for 10 minutes. Yeah, right. I complained to my parents again about Bob and they told me to quit the next time I worked. They agreed to help pay for anything I wanted to do before BMT when the money I had saved ran out because they wanted me to be happy and out of Bob's life. It was two weeks before my boyfriend left for BMT, so quitting at that time would be perfect so I could spend the next two weeks with him, which is what I did. I texted my boss and told him about Bob and how he would make sexual jokes to Lisa and how he made me uncomfortable. He said he had never heard anything about it before and I should have told him earlier. Since I was quitting, I would no longer be in that building. He couldn't go to HR to complain. Bob texted me the next night before I quit. I gave a short, dull answer. He asked if everything was okay because I wasn't my usual self. Weeks before, I stopped replying to him because why would an 18-year-old want to spend her free time texting a creepy 58-year-old? I blocked him on Facebook that night. The next day, I went into the work and I was in the cafeteria taking out trash. I saw Bob talking to Lisa, showing her something on his phone. Then he came over to me. I quickly grabbed the large garbage bag so I can use them as an excuse to leave. He told me that he had changed his lock screen because I was leaving soon. His exact words were, your eyes tell a story. It was my senior picture from almost a year ago. I was 17 in that picture. He had to scroll through my Facebook just to find it. I told him that it was nice and that I had to get on with work and walked away. The next day I went back to return my baggage and keys. I went to Lisa to ask her if she noticed how creepy Bob had been since I thought I was the only one that noticed. I wasn't the only one. She went off about how he was sexually harassing her and she laughed awkwardly to get away from it. She said, ever wonder why I stopped going to smoke breaks with you guys? I told her about her love. I told her about his love for her. She was grossed out. She then said something that made the whole last year that I've been working there come together. I think it was you all along. She thought that when Bob was complaining about his love for her, he was really talking about me. She showed me a text from him the night prior. I didn't come into work today because of OP, because it hurts that I can't text her anymore, and so on. My brother told me that Bob was out of work for three days before finally going back. I did unblock him for a day to see if our messages would still be there. They were gone when I unblocked him. To show my boss that they weren't, I did get a message from him apologizing if he was upset. Me in any way because Lisa told him that I quit because of him. He was asking if it was true. In his mind, I was like a daughter to him that unexpectedly blocked him and quit to get him out of my life. I'm sorry this isn't a very climatic story and it still creeps me out to think about how this old man groomed me. From poking my sides to slowly leading up to hugging me, kissing my head and telling me he loves me and texts me every day. I wish I would have followed my gut instinct and stopped talking to him sooner because I really wanted those damn cigarettes. I'm just happy that I have enough common sense to not go to his apartment and drink with him. He lived over by the bar that my friend's mom works at. She told me that he showed her a picture of me once, telling her how proud he is of me joining the military. So I'm a 22 year old female and I just moved into this apartment complex in the heart of downtown Baltimore. Tonight was my second night living here. and. 
I went to do the laundry that was on the lower level of the complex, kind of like the basement, and decided to use the gym that was also on the lower level, while I wait for my clothes to get washed. So I'm in the gym working out, and it's a small room with not that much equipment. I was the only one in there, and I see this guy in the hallway outside, looking at me. I ignored him and continued working out until he came into the gym and gave me a thumbs up and said, good job, and smiled, and I said, thank you. He then comes in and starts a treadmill, and I didn't want to be confined into a small space with this guy, so I went to the laundry room, and my washer was almost finished. So I waited and texted on my phone, and a few minutes later, the same guy came in and went to do his load. We were the only ones in there, and then he came up to me and showed me his phone, and it was on Google Translate, and it read, you are beautiful. I said thank you and he continued to translate for me. He said Saudi Arabia and he barely spoke any English and he was asking if he wanted to be my friend. I have a hard time saying no so I just shrugged and said okay and he asked via Google Translate for my number. I gave him a fake and he called it right in front of me and of course my phone didn't ring. He continued to call and still nothing. He told me to wait there and ran back to the elevators. I started to get a bad feeling so I left the laundry room. I waited on the other side of the hallway, past the elevators, and turned the corner where he couldn't see me and texted my boyfriend what was happening. The elevator door then opened and the man comes out and I heard him go into the laundry. I had this gut feeling telling me to run and I'm never a frantic person or anything and I don't get spooked that easily, but I just had a really bad feeling. I pressed the exit button to unlock the door that leads to the outside, and it wasn't budging. I turned around and saw him head into the gym from the mirror on the wall. I knew he was going to check this side next, so I kept frantically pushing the button, and the doors unlocked and I ran outside. I walked around for 10 minutes on my phone with my boyfriend, telling him what had happened and went to the lobby of my complex and asked the front desk lady if she could escort me to the laundry room. She said yes, and we went. The man wasn't there, and I put my clothes in the dryer, and she told me to come back and get her when the dryer was done. Forty-five minutes later, the front desk lady and I went to the laundry room, and guess who was in there? The man. He smiled and was about to say something until he saw who I was with and became quiet. I got my clothes, and we left and the guy left with us too. We all got in the elevator, with the lady in between us, and her and I got off on the lobby floor so she could show me where the other laundry rooms were on the other side of the complex. I thanked her and went on my way. I waited for the elevator to come down, and when it did, the doors opened. That man came off and held the door open for me. I said no and told him I would wait for the next one. I don't want him knowing which floor I lived on. He got off and was pacing back and forth and huffing and puffing. As soon as the next elevator opened, I got on and he tried to get on with me. I immediately got off and he was like, Come on in. Come inside. And I said no. He started to get really mad and started to walk towards me. I booked it back to the lobby and, to my luck, the front desk lady was already heading my way, telling me she had saw what had happened on the security camera. She escorted me to my room and made sure I got in safely. I'm so thankful that she was there. And this probably would have happened if I had just cut the conversation short with the man. I've never been this freaked out before and have never felt like this unsafe either. Even though he didn't necessarily do anything wrong, it was just the vibe I got off from him. I'm going to get a gym membership that's a few minutes to walk away from my building and use the laundry room on the other side of the complex just so I can lessen the chance of having never run into that man again. Long time lurker, first time poster. To set the mood, I grew up with my grandparents and older brother. I was probably 13 or so, and my brother had recently started working, so this was around the time I first stayed home alone. I think my grandparents had left to take him to work, so I'd be home for at least an hour or two. Okay, I'm loving it. Feeling very grown up. I'm watching whatever I want on TV. 
just enjoying the solitude when I hear a car. I think nothing of it, because in my kid brain I'm thinking whoever it is will take note that my grandparents' car isn't on the driveway, and just come back later. Then I hear a car door, and I'm just trying to stay where I'm at, pretend nobody is home. Now there's somebody knocking at the door. They sound persistent, but I keep telling myself that they'll just go away eventually. So I'm waiting them out. This is before the time where my grandparents would answer their cell phones while out. So I know there's no point in raising an alarm. They're still knocking, so I'm starting to get frustrated. Because who does that? Why are they knocking as if there's supposed to be somebody home? While there aren't any cars in the driveway. So I get up and we have a long bay window right in the middle of the living room. Probably about 10 feet from the front door. I'm looking out and I see a gold Buick-like sedan, older model. I didn't recognize the car, so there goes the second red flag. I quietly approached the door and put the chain on it to make sure it was locked. The whole time, this guy is still knocking louder and louder. I go back to the window to try to sneak a peek of this guy. It's an old man. I haven't seen him before. Now, my grandparents have a lot of friends their age, and I don't know them all by name or by car but I generally recognized them at least. He was super focused on the door and not giving the attention any mind. He's basically banging at this point. Then he stops. So I peeked out the window to see what he was doing now. Now there was a curtain, but it was one of those flimsy transparent ones, and I'm breathing a sigh of relief because he's walking back to his car. In my head, I'm like, phew, he gave up. He gets about halfway back to his car and he turns around. And I kid you not, we literally made direct eye contact. I drop to the floor hunched in a ball. Then the banging starts again. Somehow louder now than before. Then a pause. And at this point I'm too terrified to look out the window again, so I'm just sitting there listening. All of a sudden he's banging on the window. No, that window from the outside is not really within arm's reach. Even now, I can't easily reach it just standing at ground level. Plus, there's a bush right in front of it. So I'm shook because how in the hell this old man banging on that so hard? Then silence. Then he's banging at the door again. I was frozen underneath the window for a solid half an hour as this guy goes back and forth from the door to the window. I'm so panicked, I'm texting my friend just in case. So at least somebody would have a clue in case this guy finally gets in. I crawl from under the window to the back door and make sure everything is locked up tight. Just in case one of these pauses, he thinks to go around back. It's been around 45 minutes now, and he's still going. Then there's a really long pause and I hear a car door. I wait to hear the car turn on and I peek out as he's starting to drive down the driveway. It took me the rest of the time my grandparents were gone to process what had just happened. Was it somebody my grandfather knew trying to drop something off for him? That doesn't make sense because my grandfather would have told me. Was it somebody dropping in on him? That doesn't make sense because he should have noticed the car wasn't in the driveway. So I figured I would just wait and ask. Fast forward about an hour and my grandparents come home. I merely ask if they were expecting somebody. He seemed confused and I told him everything that happened, asking if they sounded familiar to him. He had no idea who I was talking about, said he didn't even know anybody by that car, but completely dismissed my panic. Since then, I have never seen that car or that man again. So little old man who went full hulk on my door slash window, let's not meet. In 2015, when I was about 20, I was using Tinder a lot. Sometimes I would go out with a girl and we wouldn't connect, or I'd get stood up. I went to meet up with some friends from the IU in Bloomington for a weekend. Or of just hanging out and enjoyment and I figured I might meet a nice girl and hang out and get to know. I do not remember the girl's name particularly, but we matched and we talked for about a day and Decided to hang out at her apartment that evening. I told my friends that I was about to go and what I was going to do. And that the apartment was only five minutes away from their place. I got in my car, put the GPS on, and 
made it to the apartment in a few minutes, texting her and asking which apartment door was hers. I walked around the open complex searching for the right number until I got to her building. I texted her to meet me at the door to let me in because I wasn't sure I was at the building. She said okay. I stood outside waiting for about five minutes. Let me just say, it's about 10 o'clock in the winter. I noticed something as I looked at my phone. Waiting to a window with blinds from the bottom floor open up and with what I can only assume was four different people staring at me. I texted this girl asking where she was and she had told me the door to her building was open and her apartment was the first one on the right. I walked to the door and was surprised it was unlocked. As soon as the door to the complex was shut, I turned to the left and heard from behind the door somebody say, Shh, he's outside the door. At that point, I realized the door I was at was the same one with the people staring out the window at me, and I got a gut reaction to leave or something was going to happen to me. I walked out of the complex and went by the window, which I noticed the lights had been shut off, and I ran to my car and got out of there as fast as I could. As I got back to my friend's place, I explained to them the situation, and they didn't really take it as serious as I did. As the night went on, we had a few beers. Before I went to bed, I got a text saying, Where did you go? I've been waiting for you. I blocked the number and went to sleep. So if you're ever on a dating site, always meet in public. To whoever that was, let's not meet.